And you know, there might not be three more powerful words when put together than what we celebrate this morning. <clears throat> that idea that He is risen. As we look throughout the last two millennia at the way the church has responded to that pivotal truth, to something that's backed up by, by so many truths that we see. So many people have, have looked into the events of Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. They've, they've seen, even 2,000 years later, so much proof for the resurrection. That for the last two millennia, people have, the church has responded to each other with these words of hope. He is risen. And the person who's responding to them would say, he is risen indeed. Now, by speaking those words, it doesn't mean that our problems magically go away. You see, in the early church, simply for following Jesus, they knew that they faced persecution and possibly even they could be killed for their faith. They could be imprisoned and even put to death. And so following Jesus didn't make all of their problems just disappear, quite the opposite. But in the middle of their problems, those words offered hope. In fact, those words offered hope above all hope. The fact that this life isn't all there is, and that because of what Jesus has done through his death, he's paid a price that we couldn't pay, and through his resurrection, he's defeated death, sin, and the grave. That gives us hope, because for some of us coming in here this morning, we come in with an equal measure of desperation. There's stuff going on in our life right now that we've not even been, been able to put into words. We're dealing with stuff. We're dealing with diagnoses right now that we weren't expecting. We've not even, even been able to share with our family yet because we can't find the words. For some, they're struggling, wondering if their marriage is even going to make it or if their adult children are going to come back and speak to them ever again. They're dealing with, am I going to be able to pay the mortgage this month, or am I going to lose my job? Like, we deal with these real-world issues that every one of us face from time to time. And it isn't simply by realizing that Jesus is alive, that all of those things magically just disappear. It doesn't work that way. But in the midst of our desperation, the hope above all hopes is that He is risen, and that truth is just as pivotal today to us living in the United States 2,000 years later as it was to the early followers of Jesus in Jerusalem. He is really risen. One of the things that uh, I think is amazing to kind of watch is when you see people that are going through these throes of tragedy, like when something really unexpected happens, and you watch the way the crowd responds to that tragedy. Maybe you were like me earlier this week. It was about Monday afternoon. I was just getting ready to finish up for the day. And I saw on social media, for the first time, I started to get a peep of what was taking place over in Paris as the cathedral at Notre Dame had started to burn. And it started to spread first. I saw it through social media. And then I got home and I turned on the news and I started to watch it. And it was like the whole world stood transfixed and mesmerized. We couldn't believe what was happening to this very historic building. We started to watch, we started to hear the stories of, of, her, of heroism, of, of sacrifice. We started to hear the stories of, of people rescuing these, these precious artifacts. And, and there are two things that for me stood out above all the stuff that took place during that new cycle. Before we moved on to whatever was going to happen next. There's two things that stood out. The first was the response of the crowd. You see, it affected a lot of people in the United States, and, and for us, we're thousands of miles removed, and for most of us from different uh, Christian denominations than, than what the cathedral was, but it affected us, but it even affected more so the people that were right there, the people who lived in Paris. For them, that was, that was home. It hit deep for them. And the first image I remember seeing that really started to share what the story was all about was the people of Paris who gathered just beyond the boundary that was set up where he couldn't go any further. And they just collectively started to sing hymns together because they didn't know what the appropriate response was, but they said, we're going to gather together and in the midst of this tragedy, we're going to respond as, as best we can. You know, it's amazing for me to, to sit there and watch the way people respond to tragedy. So I want to do something a little bit different this morning. I want to open up scripture and I want to look at the response to what was happening within the crowd 
as Jesus was put to death as he actually passed. Not what was the response of the crowd as he was being beaten, because early on they're bloodthirsty, early on they're shouting, crucify him, and, and, and the soldiers are putting him through a very inhumane treatment, beating him with a cat of nine tails, putting a crown of thorn upon his head. Literally, Scripture says they plucked out his beard and they gave him vinegar to drink. Like They, they did this cruel and inhumane punishment because the Romans were experts at torture. But I'm not talking about that response. I'm talking about the response of the people right at the moment that Jesus says, this is it. It is finished. If you have your Bibles, open up to the Gospel of Luke chapter 23. And I want to look at the response of the crowd immediately around Jesus. And in particular, there's one surprising response. It says in Luke 23, beginning in verse 44, it was now about the sixth hour, which their day began at 6 a.m., so it's noon. It was about the sixth hour, so it's about noon. There was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, until about 3 p.m. While the sun's light failed, the curtain of the temple was torn in two, which we'll get to that in just a second. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said this, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, it says he breathed his last. Now when the centurion, the centurion was part of the Roman guard. He was called the centurion because he oversaw a hundred different people under his watch. It says the centurion who was in charge of watching the crucifixion and making sure everything happened. And he wasn't allowed to leave his post until a body was taken down. As the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God saying, certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the woman who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. So there's a couple of different responses that we see. The first and the surprising one is the centurion. Because he was part of the people who literally put Jesus to death. But as he watches what took place that day, I want us for just a second to try to put us into his shoes and to see what he was seeing. You see, he's, he's watching this crucifixion, which for him was, was status quo. That's what he did every day of his life. He woke up that morning thinking, okay, it's another day. It's another couple of crucifixions, not a big deal. And in his life, he thought he'd seen it all because he experienced people at their worst. But this day was going to be markedly different. You see, Jesus', Jesus his response was vastly different from anything that he ever saw. Surely some of the thieves are up on a cross as they're being beaten, as they're about to die. They cry out to God, but Jesus' cry out to God was vastly different. Jesus cried out and, and said things, not just asking for, for this thing to be taken away. He prayed that earlier in this, in this scene, but as he's on a cross, he's not praying for himself. He's watching out for the people around him. And he talks to God, not as this distant, remote deity, but he talks to God as his father. And he says things like, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. And if anything else, that would have had him sit up and take note. You see, earlier he's having this discussion with the other thieves that are on either side of him. And he says to the one thief, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And, and he probably thought that was a little bit peculiar, but this was different. This was Jesus' response to the people who put him to death. And all of the other criminals would have been swearing them out and getting mad at them and, and maybe begging for leniency. But Jesus' cry was to watch out for them and to say, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And it was when he heard this that probably the centurion started to realize something is immensely different about this day. And then as Jesus' time comes close, we see a couple of things that take place. We see in Luke's gospel and in Matthew and Mark's gospel, we see what we just read, that for three hours from noon to 3 p.m., that the sun's blotted out, the sun disappears, and it becomes dark. We see things like the veil of the temple being torn from top to bottom, which I said we'll get to in just a second. We see other things in Matthew's gospel, like uh, bodies coming up out of the grave and these whole weird scenes that are taking place. As Jesus says, it is finished. 
and he breathes his last. And so the centurion watches all of this. He sees what Jesus is doing. He sees the response of Jesus. But then he sees also all these supernatural things that are taking place. And his immediate response, even though he was part of the group that put Jesus to death, his immediate response here, what we read in in, in Luke's gospel, is to say, surely this man was innocent. Like, look at his response. Look at all the stuff that took place. Surely we got this thing wrong, which would have been so out of character for the centurion who was just used to, I'm just supposed to do my job. Every criminal I've ever known has said that he's innocent. I never thought one of them was actually true until this one. He says this one was markedly different. And between his response as Jesus and also the supernatural stuff that accompanied it, he says, I have to come away from this whole scene believing that maybe for the first time, this guy was innocent. We also read of the response of the crowd that's right around Jesus. They were there as they saw all of this. Now, these aren't the people who are really close to Jesus. Those come third. But these are people who are drawn to the spectacle. They'd seen crucifixions, but this was different. The Romans were taking this differently. Jesus was taking this differently. And all the other stuff is going on. And and so they left, having felt the weight of the moment just beating their chests in sorrow, saying, I can't believe that happened. And the third group is those who are close to Jesus. Now, if you remember, as I read it through, it said this, and all his acquaintances and the women... He says he's going to point out the women because they're going to play a crucial role when Jesus is resurrected. See, it's the women who come to the tomb and are the first people to hear the words. Why is it that you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And so he mentions them here that here Jesus' closest acquaintances. And they're watching this all takes place from a distance. And there's heavy, heavy grief. There's another response from the centurion. We read in another account, in Matthew's account. It says this in Matthew 27, verse 54. When the centurion, the same centurion, and those who are with him, so these are probably other guards that are with him, they were keeping watch over Jesus. They were in charge of making sure no one messed with the body and making sure that he was dead. And after all of this transpired, it says, when they were watching, keeping watch over Jesus, on top of everything else that took place, there's also an earthquake that happens at that moment. And they saw all that took place. They were filled with awe and said this, truly this was the Son of God. So Jesus' crucifixion, we see four different responses. There's four things of note. We see the centurion's response when he's all by himself. We see the response of the crowd, the the mass that's around him. We see the response of the third group of people, those who are close to Jesus, especially the women. And we see the fourth response, which is the centurion with the others. All this at the scene where Jesus says, this is it, I'm done, it is finished. And we see that response. And we also see what I said we'd get back to. The veil in the temple being torn. Now, if you could imagine for a second, let me explain a little bit of the background, why this was so significant. In the Old Testament, the sacrificial system was such that they would have to go to the temple for these special holy days. And inside the temple, there was a place called the holy place. And inside the holy place, there's a place called the most holy place. And and in the most holy place was the place where the Ark of the Covenant resided, which for the Jewish people, that was the place that God hung out. And only one person was ever allowed to go into the most holy place, and that was the high priest. And he was only allowed to go there one day a year. And so literally the Jewish people would have lived their whole life with this separation between them and God. They weren't allowed to go in to, to be where God resided himself. And so what they'd do is they'd have to go through the high priest, and the only way they could approach God was through the priests 
in particular through the high priest. And he would go there on the day of atonement, and he would atone for the sins of his people. And if he didn't do it right, he'd, he'd die himself. And so there's this whole ritual, and it was very detailed. It had to be done just right. And the people could never approach God alone. But Jesus comes as the great high priest. He comes saying, now we don't have to go through another person to have access to the Father. We go directly through him. And so that's why at the moment of Jesus' death, that this giant veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place, that giant veil that was the symbol of the distance between us and and our Father was torn from top to bottom. Now this veil, if you could imagine, was 60 feet tall and 20 feet wide. They said by some accounts that the veil was the thickness of a man's fist. So it was this giant veil that was the the, the sign of the separation between God and man. And in something that man couldn't accomplish himself, the veil is torn not from bottom to top, but from top to bottom, saying no longer is there distance between us and God. Because of the death of Jesus, he paid a price, he paid a debt that you and I couldn't pay to give us freedom. So for the followers, they would have seen all of this and said that was all powerful. But Good Friday passes and Saturday comes and there's no other word. And the reality of death starts to set in. They start to wonder, what does this mean for us? I mean, it's possible because we are followers of his. In the crucifixion scene, Peter is already being figured out, hey, weren't you a Jesus? Like they knew this could mean punishment for them simply for following him. But more importantly, what does it mean for the movement? Is the movement just going to die? And what does it mean for his claims? But that was Saturday. Sunday morning, as the women arrive at the tomb, they come to bring spices to take care of the body. And they're greeted by the angel who says, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. And instantly word starts to spread among the people. Hey, we don't know what's going on, but some people are starting to claim that Jesus is no longer in the grave. And before you know it, Jesus starts to appear to more and more people. And the rumblings become greater and greater. And over the course of the next 40 days, Jesus is encountered by a number of different people in incredible scenes, sharing this message that I really am alive. And it births excitement. And it births an even greater passion for the movement. Now, interestingly enough, Jesus was the son of a Jewish carpenter. A lot of his teachings were in line with what people had encountered in the Old Testament. So a lot of his early followers, not all, but mostly, most of his early followers were Jewish by birth. But as the church starts to be planted and this church starts to spread, and the message, this message that he has risen starts to infiltrate the masses, they say, we want to reach everybody with the freedom that's found in Jesus. And so the book of Acts is actually the history of the message being spread in the early church. But I think there's a tie back to what we've been talking about this morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me. If not, the word's going to appear up on the screen. But in Acts chapter 10, we see this idea that as the gospel starts to spread, that the gospel is open to everybody. You see, for all of us, we want to be able to have a platform before God. We want to be able to have access to God. In the Old Testament, there was a veil that separated them from having a platform. At Jesus' death, that veil is torn, saying he's now giving us access to the Father. We're now able to have that platform. And here's the thing, that because of what Jesus did, and despite what you and I do, watch this, I want us to get this, because of what Jesus did, And despite what you and I do, because we fail him often, because of what Jesus did, we now have a platform before the Father. So we encounter in Acts chapter 10, the message of Jesus starting to spread. 
And watch this. In Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, it says this. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, just like the one who was at the cross, of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household and gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. Cornelius, who believed devoutly in God, even though he might not have been aware of who God is, he says, I want to make sure that I'm doing right. And what's going to happen, what we're going to see, as we skip down, we don't have time to read all of this, we're going to skip down to verse 34. It says this, So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation anyone who fears him and does what is acceptable to him, as for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace, through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy Spirit, with power, and he went doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we are all witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. And it says they put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but... God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who'd been chosen by God as witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people, to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judged of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So in the book of Acts, as the message starts to go forth, we see probably the first Gentile that's converted to Christianity at all. The first one who says, I'm buying into this message. Because it says, the word's now going to everybody because Jesus is truly Lord of everybody. And the first Gentile that receives that message is Cornelius, a centurion. Part of the guard who is responsible for putting Jesus to death. Now, we don't know this. This is purely speculation. But there's a lot of speculation that Cornelius is mentioned here because it's a possibility that he was the same centurion that recognized Jesus as he's being put to death. Whether that's true, we cannot be sure. But the reality of the situation is that he was from a position that was against Jesus, that worked against him. And later on, because of what happened in Jesus' resurrection, he says, I am now fully in. Despite my past, because of what God did for me, I now have a platform before him. And I want us to get that because a lot of us come in and we think, man, this can't be for me. I've done all these things in my life that I don't deserve any of this. And that's true of every one of us. But through his death, Jesus paid a debt that you and I owed but could never pay. But he paid that debt for us that we could experience a freedom that's only found in him. And it isn't just something we talk about on Easter. So as we gather together, our goal as a church is to help everyone realize who Jesus is and to take those next steps. Would you pray with me? Here's the thing. We've come to celebrate the central truth that Jesus is alive. And that right there is cause for celebration. But through his life, he wants to give us life. He wants to give you life. And so maybe, I don't know right now, if, if you're living within that freedom that's found in Jesus. I don't know if that's where you've been, but if not, we want to help you take those next steps. And so in just a second, I'm going to pray a prayer, but I want to know who I'm praying for. And I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand or embarrass you, but I just want to be able to know who I'm praying for. And so as I pray, if, if you would say this, if you would say, JJ, I, I don't know, I've, I, I love Jesus, but I've never experienced the freedom that you're talking about. Like I yearn to have that freedom. As everyone else is kind of looking down and no one's looking around, I just want you real quick, just look up at me and say, man, I want to experience that freedom today that you're talking about. 
If you just look up and make eye contact with me and say, man, I want to have that freedom. Thank you so much. I see you guys looking at me. Thank you so much. Man, just to experience that freedom as we gather together to celebrate the resurrection and the hope that comes through Jesus, that's our goal, is for you to experience that freedom. God, I thank you for a number of people this morning who said, man, I, I'm on board. I, I want to do this, but, but I want to be like Cornelius who wasn't just content to, to watch and, and to do the things that he wanted to do because, God, when we create a platform ourselves, it's weak and it falls apart. But, God, when Jesus creates that platform for us, it now gives us right standing before you. God, for those that made that decision this morning, I pray that in the coming days and weeks that they'd walk in that freedom, discovering what Jesus has done and who he is. For as the centurion had stood vastly opposed to who Jesus was and he encountered the actual Jesus, his life was forever changed. God, I pray that for people this morning that you'd change their lives. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I saw a number of people that were looking up as, as we prayed that prayer. Uh, listen, as we get ready to close out with this last song, I would just ask you at some point this morning before you leave, take one of those connection cards that's in front of you and just fill that out and let us know what decision you made so that we can follow up with you this week. We, our goal as a church is to help you discover who Jesus is and help you in taking those next steps. And so we don't want to embarrass you, we don't want to make a big deal about it, but we do want to celebrate with you. So at some point as we get ready to wrap up, just fill out a card. We just need your name and a way to contact you and what decision you made, and we want to celebrate with you. One more thing. I shared early on about the fire at Notre Dame, and I said there were two things. I only mentioned one. The other thing, the last thing image I'm going to have of that whole scene was when the fire was finally put out and the firefighters were able to enter the cathedral. This right here was their view. It's all that was left as they walked in. That cross lit up was still standing. And here's the thing for us to take hope in this morning. Is that when the dust has settled, when the smoke is cleared, the cross is empty, the grave is empty, and Jesus is alive. And that's what we celebrate this morning. Stand with us as we sing.